to navigate, there's two things you need to know. And the first is, where the hell are you? Exactly, precisely, right? Razor sharp. What's good about you and what's bad about you? By your own, by your own reckoning. You don't have to, you can ask other people, but this is a game you play yourself. It's like, as far as I'm concerned, I'm taking stock. What is it that's okay about me and what needs some work? And you gotta watch to not be too self-critical when you're doing that too, because that can just be another kind of flaw. And then the next is, okay, well, where are you going? What's your destination? Well, and that's what the frame is. Now, you know, you, you could do that in a very sophisticated way. And you do that by thinking consciously about who it is that you are in an articulated manner and where you want to go and why and how you're going to get there. And people hardly ever do that. That is, that's come as such an absolute shock to me as an educator. I, I just, because one of the other programs, I, I use this in my classes, one of the other programs in this suite of programs is called the Future Authoring Program. And I started developing it in my Maps of Meaning class, which is where some of this material is from. And I got students to write about their past. It's like, okay, we're, we're talking about stories, so let's tell your story. Who are you? How do you get here? And what are you now? That usually helps people put things to rest, although it's quite stressful while you're doing it. Stress goes up when you're doing it, and maybe you feel miserable for a couple of weeks, and then stress goes down and it stays down. So that's, and that's also why people don't do it, because who the hell wants to have their stress go up? But if it's temporary, it's a sacrifice. So then the next issue is, well, where are you going? And one of the things that, and this I just still, I cannot understand. These students that have been in education system for 15 years, 14 years, high-end students, most of them, not once in their whole bloody life did anyone ever get them to sit down for like a day and say, all right, justify your existence. <laughs> like, well, seriously, it's like here you are in university, you're taking a bunch of courses, you've got some sort of vague career plan. It's like, defend the damn thing a bit, since you're going to go live it and everything, you're staking everything on it. It's like, what's your damn plan? And why are you so convinced that it's not the plan of a babbling fool? Because if you haven't thought about it, then it is. And if you really want to go out there and live that out, you know, one of the things Carl Jung said was that you, you're in a story, whether you know it or not. And, and then he made two nice comments about that. If it's someone else's story, you're probably going to get a bit part. And it might not be the one you want. And if it's a story that you don't know, it might be one with a really bad ending. Or maybe it's just bad period with a worse ending. And if you don't know what the story that you're living out is, maybe that's the one. You know, maybe you got that from your mother, you got it from your grandmother, you got it from your aunt, or God only knows where you picked it up because you pick up things like mad because that's what human beings are like. So maybe you're living a malevolent tragedy unconsciously. And then one thing you might ask yourself is, well, how wretched and miserable is your life? Let's add futile to that. How wretched, miserable, and futile is your life? And you might say, well, yeah, 70% on each count. It's like, then you're probably unconsciously living out a malevolent tragedy. And maybe that's not for the best. Well, it's either that or the whole universe hates you. Getting away plus getting forward are separate motivational systems. And if you can add them together, it's real potent. And part of the reason why in the future authoring exercise that you guys are going to do as the class progresses you're asked to outline the place you'd like to end up which is your desired future and also the place that you could end up if you let everything fall apart is so that your anxiety chases you and your approach systems pull you forward you're maximally motivated then and it's important because otherwise you can be afraid of pursuing the things that you want to pursue right and that's very common and so then the fear inhibits you as the promise pulls you forward, but it makes you weak because you're afraid. You want to get your fear behind you, pushing you. And so what you want to be is afraid, more afraid of not pursuing your goals than you are of pursuing them. It's very, very helpful. And lots of times in life, and this is something really worth knowing, you know, and this is one of the advantages to being an autonomous adult, is you don't get to pick the best thing. You get to pick your poison. You have two bad choices, and you get to pick which one you're willing to suffer through. And every choice has a bit of that element in it. And so, if you know that, it's really freeing. Because otherwise, you torture yourself by thinking, well, maybe there's a good solution to this, you know, compared to the bad solution. It's like, no, no, sometimes there's just risky solution one, 
and risky solution two. And sometimes both of them are really bad, but you at least get to pick which one you're willing to suffer through. And that's, that actually makes quite a bit of difference because you're also facing it voluntarily then instead of it chasing you. And that is an entire different, entirely different psychophysiological response. Challenge versus threat, it's not the same, even if the magnitude of the problem is the same. And so putting yourself in a challenging, let's call it mind frame, you can't just do that by magic. Putting yourself in a challenging mind frame is much, be much easier on you psychophysiologically because you don't produce, you don't go into the generalized stress response to the same degree. And you're activating your exploratory and seeking systems which are dopaminergically mediated and that involve positive emotion. So if you can face something voluntarily rather than having it chase you, it's way better for you psychophysiologically. So, that's partly why, well, it's worthwhile to go find the dragon in its lair instead of waiting for it to come and eat you. So, and especially when you also add the idea that if you go find the dragon in its lair, you might find it when it's a baby instead of a full-fledged bloody monster that is definitely going to take you down. And so that's part of the reason why, well, there's a whole bunch of things that, that, that emerge out of that observation, like don't avoid small problems that you know are there face them because they'll grow into big problems all by themselves and you can think about imagine the tax department sends you a notification you owe them like three hundred dollars well it's, it's you know that's annoying maybe you don't even want to open the letter or maybe if you do you just put it on the shelf but that damn thing doesn't just sit there like a piece of paper on the shelf right you ignore that for five or six years it's going to become attached to all sorts of horrible things and if you ignore it long enough you get the idea it's going to turn into something that is completely unlike the little piece of paper that it's written on. And, and many, many problems in life are like that. You'll see, they'll, you'll see that they pop their ugly little head up and you know, and you might want to turn away, you might not want, not want to think about it, which is the easiest way of turning away, right? You just don't attend to it. It's not like you repress it or anything like that. You just fail to attend to it. And that's a really, as a long-term strategy, it's dismal. So anyways, you know, we got students to start writing in detail about not what they wanted. It's not a career thing, because that's the closest people usually get is they have a career plan. It's like, no, no, it's not a career plan. That's, that's peripheral, important, but peripheral. It's like, all right, you got three years, man. You're going to live them anyways. Devote those three years to setting the world up around you so that it's the best it could possibly be for you as if you were taking care of yourself, as if you cared for yourself. Well, what would that look like? You know, let's say, just for the sake of argument, if you figured out where you were, that you could have what would be best for you. Well, what is that? I bet you, you never asked. People don't ask, and so life comes at them like random snakes, and they sort of fend them off, and life goes by, and things don't work out the way people expected them to but a huge part of that is they didn't know where they were because they wouldn't look or didn't know that they should look ignorance and willful blindness right two great catastrophes and they never figured out where they wanted to go or why now there's a problem with figuring out where you want to go and the problem is is that you make your conditions for failure clear to yourself and people don't like that so if you keep yourself in the fog then you can't tell when you screwed up. Now that isn't so good because you're still screwing up. You're just too blind, self-blind to notice. Although in, in, sh in the short term, that's less painful. If you make your criteria for success razor sharp, then you know every time you screw up. But that's great because then you could fix it. You could either repair the, the, the behavioral inadequacy or the conceptual inadequacy that you're using as a tool in that situation or maybe you could adjust your damn plan either way you can fix it and so okay so you're living in one of these bloody things and you might as well it seems to me you might as well make it the best one you could live in because you don't have anything better to do now if you don't do that if you don't do it consciously and, and this is what the psychoanalyst pointed out is that you have innumerable quasi-autonomous subsystems that make you up that will generate stories impulsively and you'll just act them out. 
And you know that because you watch yourself over two weeks and you think, Jesus, I did a lot of stupid things in the last two weeks. And you think, why? And it's because you're a random, you're a collection of somewhat random quasi-autonomous personality units and lacking a leader, they're just going to fire off whenever they want, you know. First you're hungry, then you're thirsty, then you want to go to bed with your wife, you know. Then you want to sleep in, then you want to tell your boss off, then you want to curse at the guy that cuts you off in traffic. It's like, you're kind of like a two-year-old, you know, just it's one emotional frame after another vying for dominance. There's no overarching hierarchy and there's no king at the top. And the idea is this, is that if you configure your life so that what you are genuinely doing is aiming at the highest possible good, then the things that you need to, to survive and to thrive on a day-to-day -day basis will deliver themselves to you. That's a hypothesis, and it's not some simple hypothesis, right? Because it, what it basically says is, if you dare to do the most difficult thing that you can conceptualize, your life will work out better than it will if you do anything else. Well, how are you going to find out if that's true? Well, it's a Kierkegaardian leap of faith. There's no way you're going to find out whether or not that's true unless you do it. So, no, no one can tell you either, because just because it works for someone else, I mean, that's interesting and all that but it's no proof that it'll work for you you have to be all in in this game and so the idea is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness it's like that's actually a fairly important caution when you're talking about not having to pay attention to what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear it's like what it's essentially saying is that those problems are trivial in comparison and the probability is that if you manifest yourself properly in the world that those things will come your way is extraordinarily high and I believe I believe that that's exactly right I mean I I've, I've watched people operate in the world and I would say that there is no more effective way of operating in the world than to conceptualize the highest good that you can and then strive to attain it there's no more practical pathway to the kind of success that you could have if you actually knew what success was and so that's what this, that's what this sermon is attempting to, to posit. It's like in, in the story of Pinocchio, you know, what happens at the beginning of the story of Pinocchio is that Geppetto wishes on a star. We talked about that a little bit. And so what Geppetto does is align himself with the metaphorical manifestation of the highest good he can conceptualize and say, he says, he makes, a, he makes a commitment, let's say, he aims at the star, and for him the star is the possibility that he can take his creation, a puppet, right, whose strings are being pulled by unseen forces, and have it transform into something that's autonomous and real. Well, that's a hell of an ambition. You know, and we're wise enough to put that in a children's movie, but too foolish to understand what it means. It's such an interesting juxtaposition that, that we can both know that and not know it at the same time. You can go to the movie, you can watch it, and it makes sense. But that doesn't mean that you can go home and think, well, I know what that meant. Well, people are complicated, right? We exist at different levels, and all the levels don't communicate with one another. But, but the movie is a hypothesis, and the hypothesis is there's no better pathway to self-realization and the ennoblement of being than to posit the highest good that you can conceive of and commit yourself to it. And then you might also ask yourself, and this is definitely worth asking, is do you really have anything better to do? And if you don't, well, why would you do anything else? It's really fun to look at these old pictures once you kind of know what they mean. You know, at least that's what I've discovered, is that once I kind of understand the, the underlying rationale for I mean someone worked hard on that that's an engraving right they took a long time making that picture they're serious about it and when you understand what it means you know all those people they're 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 prostrate prostrate at the um, at the at the revelation of the law 
It's like, well, no wonder. It's like, break the law and see what happens. Break the universal moral law, man, and see what happens. You know, I see people in that situation, well, as you all do all the time, perhaps me more than you because I'm a clinical psychologist, you know, and if the people I'm seeing haven't broken the universal law, then you can bloody well be sure that people around them have. It's no joke. Like, you make a mistake and things will go seriously wrong for you. And so, it's no wonder that you'd be terrified at the revelation of the structure that governs our being. One of the things that's so remarkable about the Old Testament, this is another thing Nietzsche commented on, he was a real admirer of the Old Testament, not so much of the New Testament. He thought it was a sin for Europe to have glued the New Testament onto the Old Testament, because he thought the Old Testament was a really accurate representation of the phenomenology of being. It's like, stay awake, speak properly, be honest, or watch the hell out because things will come your way that you just do not want to see at all. And it might not just be you, it might be everyone you know and everything about your culture that is demolished for, for generation after generation. It's like, stay awake and be careful. And I, like, I think that people only don't believe that when they're being hubristic. And I think that most people know that deep in their hearts. You know, when you get high on your horse, that happens fairly often. If you have any sense, you think, geez, I better be careful and tap myself down a fair bit because if I get too puffed up, man, something's going to come along and take me out at the knees. And everyone knows that. Pride comes before a fall. It's like, if you have any, that's why it says in the Old Testament that fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's like, I've never, in, in all my years as a clinical psychologist, and this is something that really does terrify me, I, has, I have never seen anyone ever get away with anything at all, even once. You know, there's that old idea that God has a book, you know, and keeps track of everything in heaven. It's like, okay, okay, you know, maybe it's not a book. Fine. But that is a really useful thing to think about because, well, and maybe you disagree. Maybe you think people get away with things all the time. I tell you, I've never seen it. What I see instead is that thing happens, right? They, someone twists the fabric of reality. And they do it successfully because it doesn't snap back at them that moment. And then like two years later, something unravels. And they get walloped and they think, oh my God, that's so unfair. And then we track it. It's like, well, what happened before that? This. Well, and then what? This. And then what? This. And then what? Oh, oh, this. Oh, that's where it went wrong. It's, yeah, because you can't twist the fabric of reality without having it snap back. It doesn't work that way. And why would it? Because what are you going to do? Twist the fabric of reality? I don't think so. I think it's bigger than you, you know, and I think that one of the things that really tempts people is the idea that, well, I can get away with it. It's like, yeah, you try. You see how well that works. It's like you, you get away with nothing. And, and that is the beginning of wisdom. And it's something that deeply terrifies me. And, you know, ever, ever since last September, when I've come to more, like, broader public attention, one of the things, I've been terrified of making a mistake because I certainly know I'm more than capable of making a mistake. And thank God, so far, either I haven't made one or no one's found out about it. <laughs> so, but it's like, you know, we walk on a very thin and narrow edge. And we're very lucky when things aren't degenerating into chaos around us or rapidly moving to far too much order. And it's not an easy thing to stay on that line. And you can tell when you stay, you're on that line because the things are deeply meaningful and engaging when you're on that line. But if you're not existentially terrified about the consequences of wavering off that, then you are truly not awake. Therefore, take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I spent a long time trying to figure out what that meant too, because it's another one of those lines that can easily be read as pro-grasshopper and anti-ant, you know, you remember the old fable of the grasshopper and the ant? Maybe not, I'm not going to tell it, but the ant works and the grasshopper fiddles and the ant has a pretty good time in the winter and the grasshopper dies. And so, this is like a pro-grasshopper line, but it's not because it says something else. It says that if you orient yourself properly and then pay attention to what you do every day, that works. And it, I actually think that that's in accordance with, with what we have come to understand about human perception. Because what happens is that the world shifts itself around your aim. Because you're, you're a creature that has an aim. 
You have to have an aim in order to do something. You're an aiming creature. You look at a point and you move towards it. It's built right into you. And so you have an aim. Well, let's say your aim is the highest possible aim. Well, then, so that sets up the world around you. It, it organizes all of your perceptions. It organizes what you see and you don't see. It organizes your emotions and your motivations. So you organize yourself around that aim. And then what happens is the day manifests itself as a set of challenges and problems. And if you solve them properly, then you stay on the pathway towards that aim. And you can concentrate on the, on the, on the day. And so that way you get to have your cake and eat it too. Because you can, you can point into the distance, the far distance. And you can live in the day. And it seems to me that that's... That makes every moment of the day supercharged with meaning. That, that's how, because if everything that you're doing every day is related to the highest possible aim that you can conceptualize, well, that's the very definition of the meaning that would sustain you in your life. Well, and then the issue is, well, back to Noah. Well, all hell's about to break loose and chaos is coming. It's like when that's happening in your life, you might want to be doing something that you regard as truly worthwhile. Because that's what will keep you afloat when, when everything is flooded. And you don't want to wait until the flood comes to start doing that because if your ark's half built and you don't know how to captain it, the probability is very high that, that you'll drown. Final rule. It's called pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. And it's, it's a very, it's the most personal chapter in the book. It's a lot about my daughter. And my daughter was very ill when she was, well, when she was a kid, but uh, well, particularly when she was a teenager, she had a very terrible time of it. Um, she had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And when she was between the ages of 14 and 16, it first destroyed her hip, which had to be replaced. And then it destroyed the ankle on her other leg, which had to be replaced and she walked around for two years on broken legs and she was taking massive doses of opiates and could hardly stay awake and like and she had this advanced autoimmune disease which produced all sorts of other symptoms that were just as bad as the joint degeneration but which are harder to describe and so it's just bloody brutal you know and as a test of your faith there's almost nothing that's more direct than a serious illness inflicted upon an innocent child right and so the chapter is a meditation on that and also on well, what to do in a situation like that because everyone is going to have a situation like that in some sense, you know, because you'll be faced with illness in the people that you love and in crisis. And so it's a, it's a practical guide to coping with those sorts of things. Like in one of the things you do when you're overwhelmed by crisis is you shorten your time frame. You know, it's like you can't think about next month. Maybe you can't even bloody well think about next week or maybe not even tomorrow. You know, because now is just so overwhelming that that's all there is. It's like, and that's what you do. You cut your time frame back until you can cope with it. And if it's not the next week that you see how to get through, then it's the next day. And if it's not the next day, then it's the next hour. And if it's not the next hour, then it's the next minute. And you know, people are very, 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 very tough. It turns out that if you face things that you can put up with a lot more than you think you can put up with and you can do it without becoming corrupted. And she did recover quite, quite fully and much as a consequence of her own machinations because she figured out what was wrong with her and then took the necessary steps to fix it, which is nothing short of a bloody miracle as far as I'm concerned. And uh, anyways, part of the, the, the cat bit is, I actually start by talking about our dog, who actually died about a year ago, but he's still alive in the book. Um, you know, if you want to pet a dog on the street, that's okay too, so you don't have to get up in arms about it. But, but the idea is that, you know, you have to be alert when you're suffering. You have to be alert to the beauty in life, the unexpected beauty in life. And that's kind of what I was trying to get across with the idea of the cat. There's this cat that lives across the street from us called Ginger, and Ginger's a Siamese cat. And cats really aren't domesticated, eh? technically speaking. They're still wild animals, but they kind of like people. God only knows why, but they do, you know. And so Ginger will come wandering over, and our dog looks at her, but they're friends, and she rolls over on his back, and Seiko used to, you know, nose her a bit. And, and then she'd kind of mosey over and let you pet her if she was feeling like it that day. And, you know, you have to look for those 
little bit of that little bit of sparkling crystal in the darkness when things are bad you have to look and see where things are still beautiful and where there's still something that's sustaining and you know you narrow your time frame and you be grateful for what you have and that can get you through some very dark times why did i write these rules well you know and especially when I said, well, you should try to improve yourself instead of trying to set the world straight. Or in, instead of worrying about what other people are doing wrong, you might say, well, that's a hell of a thing for someone to say who just wrote a book called 12 Rules for Life. It's like, you know, but the thing is, is that I wasn't just writing that. I was writing that for me as much as for anyone else. And I, I mean that, I really mean that sincerely. You know, I had an opportunity to spend somewhere around five years meditating on how you should conduct yourself so that your life is what it could be and like I'm in the group of people that I'm advising you, you know what I mean it's like all of these things are very difficult to stand up straight to remember that and to treat yourself like you're someone worthwhile and to make friends with people who are good for you and 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 to tell the truth or at least not to lie I mean these are all ideals right and especially taken as a whole they constitute a kind of ideal and you never you never you never attain the ideal the, and not only that, it recedes as you approach it, right? Because you, you straighten yourself out and you think, well, I've got it now. And you think, no, wait a minute, there's more to go. There's still more to go. And then you get that much farther along the line. You think, oh, yeah, I thought this was the end of the road. It's like, no, there's plenty of imperfections left to iron out. And so it is a constant adjustment. And, but there's something about that that's also positive. Because you might say that it's not so much that there isn't such a thing as a good person. It's that our idea of what constitutes good isn't right. Because a good person is someone who's trying to get better. And, and no matter how good you are, there's better that you can get, but the, the real goodness is in the attempt, right? It's in the, it's in the process, to, to use somewhat of a cliche. You know, there's this, and I'll close with this, and it's a good way, way to close, you know, and this is a psychological observation. The, the central figure of Western culture is Christ. And we can look at that psychologically, because Christ is the dying and resurrecting hero. And what does that mean psychologically? Well, it means that <clears throat> you learn things painfully. And when you learn something painfully, a part of you has to die. That's the pain. You know, when a dream is shattered, for example. A huge part of you that, that constituted that dream, maybe even the biological substrate of that dream, has to be stripped away and, and burned. And so, life is a constant process of death and rebirth. And to participate in that fully is to allow yourself to be redeemed by it. And so the good is that process of death and rebirth, voluntarily undertaken. It's like you're not as good as you could be, so you let that part of you die. And if someone comes along and says, you know, there's some dead wood here, man, it needs to be burned off. You think, well, that stuff's still a bit alive. When that burns, it's gonna hurt. It's like, yeah, well, no kidding. But maybe the thing that emerges in its place is something better. And I think this is the secret of human beings. This is what we're like, you know, unlike any other creature is that we can let our old selves die and let our new selves be born. And that's what we should do. And so, where do I fall short in these 12 rules? Well, endlessly, because, well, here's a way of thinking about it. Until the entire world is redeemed, we all fall short. And you can do that, you know, in the worst situation, you can make it only tragic and not hell. And there's a big gap between tragedy and hell, you know, there's nothing worse at a deathbed than to see the people there fighting. The death is bad enough, but you can take that, as terrible as it is, and make it into something that's absolutely unbearable. And maybe I think, and this is sort of what I closed the book with, is this idea is that if we didn't all attempt to make terrible things even worse than they are, then maybe we could tolerate the terrible things that we have to put up with in order to exist. And maybe we could make the world into a better place, you know? And it's what we should be doing and what we could be doing because we don't have anything better to do. And that's what the book is about. And 
that's the end of 12 Rules for Life. Thank you. One of the other things I've learned as a social scientist, and I've been warned about this by, I would say, great social scientists, that you want to be very careful about doing large-scale experimentation with large-scale systems. Because the probability that if you implement a scheme in a large-scale social system, that that scheme will have the result you intended is negligible what will happen will be something that you don't intend and even worse something that works at counter purposes to your original intent and so and that, that makes sense because if you have a very very complex system and you perturb it the probability that you can predict the consequence of the perturbation is extraordinarily low obviously if the system works though you, you think you understand it because it works and so you think it's simpler than it actually is and so then you think that your model of it is correct, and then you think that your manipulation of the model, which produces the outcome you model, will be the outcome that's actually produced in the world. And that doesn't work at all. I thought about that an awful lot, thinking about how to remediate social systems, because obviously they need careful attention and adjustment. And it struck me that the proper strategy for implementing social change is to stay within your domain of competence and that requires humility which is a, a virtue that is never promoted in modern culture I would say it's it's a virtue that you can hardly even talk about but humility means you're probably not as smart as you think you are and you should be careful and so then the question might be well okay you should be careful but perhaps you still want to do good or you, you want to make some positive changes how can you be careful and do good and then I would say well you try not to step outside of the boundaries of your competence and you start small and you start with things that you actually could adjust that you actually do understand that you actually could fix I, I mentioned to you at one point that one of the things Carl Jung said was that modern men don't see God because they don't look low enough it's a very interesting phrase and one of the things that I've been promoting I suppose online is the idea that you should restrict your attempts to fix things to what's at hand so there's probably things about you that you could fix right things that you know that aren't right not anyone else's opinion your own opinion that aren't right you can fix them maybe there's some things that you could adjust in your family well that gets hard you have to have your act together a lot before you can start to adjust your family because things can kick back on you really hard and you think well it's hard to put yourself together it's really hard to put your family together why the hell do you think you can put the world together right because obviously the world is more complicated than you and your family and so if you if you're stymied in your attempts even to set your own house in order which of course you are then you would think that what that would do would be to make you very very leery about announcing your broad-scale plans for social revolution <laughs> well it's a peculiar thing because that isn't how it works because people are much more likely to announce their plans for broad-scale social revolution than they are to try to set themselves straight or to set their family straight and I think the reason for that is that as soon as they try to set themselves straight or their families the system immediately kicks back at them right instantly whereas if they announce their plans for large-scale social revolution the lag between the announcement and the kickback is so long that they don't recognize that there's any error there. And so, you know, you can get away with being wrong if, if, if nothing falls on you for a while. And so, and it's also an incitement to hubris because you can announce your, your plans for large-scale social revolution and stand back and you don't get hit by lightning and you think, well, I might be right, even though you're not. You're seriously not right. I might be right, and then you think, well, how wonderful is that? Especially if you could do it without any real effort. And I really do think 
fundamentally, I believe that that's what universities teach students now. That's what they teach them to do. I, re I really believe that. And I think it's absolutely appalling. Because it's not that easy to fix things, especially if you don't, well, especially if you're not committed to it. And I think you know if you're committed because what you try to do is you try to straighten out your own life first. And that's enough. Like there's a, I think it's a statement in the New Testament that it's, I think it's in the New Testament that it's more difficult to rule yourself than to rule a city. And that's not a metaphor. It's like all of you who've made announcements to yourself about changing your diet and going to the gym every January know perfectly well how difficult it is to regulate your own impulses and to bring yourself under the control of some, what would you say, well-structured and ethical, attentive structure of values. It's extraordinarily difficult and so people don't do it and they, instead they wander off and I think they create towers of Babel and the story indicates, well, those things collapse under their own weight and everyone goes their own direction. So that ends, I would say, the most archaic stories in the, in the Bible. There's something about the flood story and, and also the Tower of Babel. I think they outline the two fundamental dangers that beset mankind. One is the probability that blindness and sin will produce a natural catastrophe or entice one. That's something modern people are very aware of in principle, right? Because we're all hyper-concerned about environmental degradation and catastrophe. And so, that's the continual reactivation of an archetypal idea in our, in our unconscious minds, that there's something about the way we're living that's unsustainable and that will create a catastrophe. It's so interesting because people believe that firmly and deeply and, but they don't see the relationship between that and the archetypal stories because it's the same story Overconsumption greed all of that is producing an unstable state and nature will rebel and take us down Right you hear that every day in every newspaper and every TV station. It's broadcast to you constantly and so that idea is presented in in Genesis in the story of Noah and then the other warning that exists in the stories. One is beware of natural catastrophe that's produced as a consequence of blindness and greed, we'll say. The other is beware of social structures that overreach because they'll also produce fragmentation and disintegration. And so it's quite remarkable, I think, that that with at the close of the story of the Tower of Babel, we've got both of the permanent existential dangers that present themselves to humanity already identified. What seems to go along with that is something like truth in conception and action. You know, even people like Jacob, who are pretty damn morally ambivalent to begin with, get hammered a lot by what they go through and what seems to happen is that they're hammered into some sort of ethical shape, right? So by the midpoint of their life's journey, there's people who are solidly planted, who you can trust and who don't betray being or themselves or their fellow man. And so it's an interesting, I mean, it seems reasonable to me to first assume that you have to establish a relationship with something that's transcendent. It might even be just the future version of you. But, and then second, that you have to align yourself with reality in a truthful manner, and that that's your best bet. And the biblical stories are actually quite realistic about that too, because they don't really say that if you do that, you're going to be instantly transported to the promised land. Like even Moses, as we'll find out in the Exodus stories, he never makes it to the promised land. And so, it's not like you're offered instantaneous final redemption if you move out forthrightly into the world, establish a faithful relationship with being, and attempt to conduct yourself with integrity. But it's your best bet, and it might be good enough. And even if it's not good enough, it's really preferable to the alternative, which seems to be something 
closely akin to hell, both personal and social.